Well, we are going to be in Ephesians 5. Uh, focusing on 15, 16, and 17. And I'm just going to read those first for you here today. Uh, you don't need to worry about it, Ruth. Just, uh, or I guess Joey. Just listen to these words here. The Word of God. This is from the Apostle Paul. Paul writes these words. He says, Look carefully, then, how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of the time, because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Amen. Well, we are in a series here right now, a series called Time, and we're talking about time, and we started talking about this two weeks ago, so we're on week three. Uh, two weeks ago, we started off with a psalm, uh, interesting little psalm, because that psalm was written by Moses, actually, rather than David or Solomon or whomever. Moses snuck one in. And so Psalm 90 was the, the psalm that we looked at. It was Psalm 90:12 that we kind of focused on. And... Uh, that gave us the context for the whole series. And then we looked at what we are doing with our time. And we learned last week that our priorities determine our capacity. And you get more done by putting the most important things in your life first. And we talked, and we used the example, the video didn't work, but talked about the rocks and the God rock and the family rock and your kids perhaps or, or your job rock. But putting the big things into the jar, the big things into the bucket first... And then you put in the next layer, the, the smaller things. And then at the end, if there's still more, that little pebbly sand, you can pour that in and it'll all fit. But if you put it in the wrong order, if you start with the unimportant things, then you get to maybe some of the so-so important things. And then you try to squeeze those big rocks in, they don't fit, right? And so important learning that our priorities determine our capacity. And today we're going to be talking about another principle as it relates to our biblical view on time. And we're, like I said, going to be working out of Ephesians 5. Uh, you're welcome to follow along in Bibles. I'll get back to that and, and walk through that here in a minute. If you've got an iPhone, iPad, uh, electronic device, feel free to look it up. version is a good way to do that on your phone or on your iPad. Um, but before we get to that, I'd like to kind of dig into some general biblical spiritual principles about time that aren't specifically in this verse but relate well to this verse. And there's three of them that I just want to point out. And they're three items that I think intellectually we would all go, yeah, I know that, right? But as with so many things, uh, particularly out of Scripture, it bears repeating. It warrants our reminding ourselves again and again and again because if we could just read the Bible once, right, and then we got it all right and we lived it out and life was perfect then, right, that would be great. But my experience is we read the Bible and then we either forget or ignore what we just read and we don't live it out and we're sinners and we're broken, right? Is that everybody in the room? Good, welcome here, sinners. This is the right place you came to today. So it bears repeating. We, we have to go back again and again and again and remind ourselves and, and year after year throughout our lives, uh, re-plug into our lives, into our schedules, these grand ideas. And, and the first one of those uh, that I want to point out, and this is an incredibly important thing for all of life, particularly spiritual life, but all of life, but there is indeed a cumulative value to investing small amounts of time in certain activities over a long period, right? So one of the things you hear when you're young, we still have some younger folks in the room, I am no longer young, although comparatively I'm a little younger, but there are some young folks in the room. And if you're young, one of the greatest things you can do when you are young is just start investing money, right? I've, I've learned the power of compounding interest. Uh, my, my retirement account, you know, set it and forget it. Just send some money in and pretend it doesn't exist. Don't look at it, don't think about it, just keep sending money, right? And that sounds kind of crazy, but when you're young, that's an incredibly effective strategy because over time, that will grow. And if you set it up, I, I use a Vanguard account, which doesn't matter to anybody, but I use a Vanguard account and I send money there for my Roth and for my uh, IRA and, and it just kind of disappears out of my accounts. But someday, as it's been growing, I'll be able to retire, hopefully, and enjoy the fruits of my set it and forget it kind of investing. And so with many areas of our lives, those small investments, those little continual investments 
of time, or money, as I said, in a specific activity over a long period can make a big, big difference. Small investments over long periods of time can have a huge payoff, right? Now, I said this a couple of weeks ago, you got to remember, I'm preaching this to myself as much as I preach it to you. And, and you know these are truths, right? Little investments, little investments in your relationships, little investments with your children, for instance. Now, it's great to go on vacation. You make some wonderful memories when you hop in the, in the family station wagon and you truck it all the way across the country to somewhere. And, you know, you, you get all the kinds of stories from that week long in the back, you know. How many of you ever rode in the back, back, way back, backwards looking seat of a station wagon, right? And, and, and how many of you had one of the windows that went down so that all the carbon monoxide could come in while you were riding? <laughs> yeah, me too. That was me. My parents didn't have that car, it was my grandmother. Man, that was a long time ago. But uh, you make great memories on those kinds of trips. But the difference, the difference you make in your kids' lives is on that day-to-day -day cumulative effect. When you want to teach your kids about morals and values and aims and ideals, you don't just do it once and then you're done. You don't just do it once for seven straight days and then you're done. You do it again and again and again, over and over and over, expressing what it is you want them to understand and learn, making those tiny little investments, right? So when I get up in the morning with my son and we're sitting there before school, we're sitting at the breakfast table, I sit there and do devotions with him because I want him to be a little man of God. I want him to see God in my life. I want to model for him reading of scripture. I want him to make this part of his life because someday I'm not gonna get to wake up with him and have him under my roof and have him sit at the kitchen table eating Honey Nut Cheerios with me, right? Someday he's gonna be out on his own. So those little tiny investments I'm making now, I hope will pay great dividends a couple decades down the road somewhere. Okay? And so those little bits of investments over many, many years make a big, big difference. Now there's, as I'm doing this, there's no uh, single benefit to any one of those little installments, right? So when I send my money to my retirement, I'm not going to retire off of that one single payment. When I sit down with my son at breakfast and do a single devotion with him, that single devotion is probably not going to determine whether or not he walks in faith for the rest of his life. It's a cumulative effect, and we have to keep that in mind. Sometimes we get discouraged. Sometimes we miss a day, right? Like on your own spiritual disciplines. We talked about this last week, about, about sitting down and doing, doing your own devotional reading and spending some time in prayer. Well, if you miss a day, okay, that's fine. Pick it up again tomorrow. That happens. You get distracted, something comes up, life happens. The problem is when it becomes one day and then two days and two days becomes four days and four days becomes a week and a week and so on and it gets to grow. That's when the problems start to creep in. If you think about it, it's kind of like, you know, look at me. I'm a big guy. I want to lose some weight. I want to get in shape, right? So imagine I told you this morning, I went to the gym last night and I ran four miles. How many of you would be looking at me going, wow, you look different today, right, Pastor? Did you lose some weight or something? I don't know. What'd you do? I, I did cut my hair. Does that, was that it? You know? Right? That, that run in four miles last night, which I didn't do. I should have. <laughs> but uh, that running four miles, you're not going to see that one installment. Now, if I run four miles every day for the next two months, six months, ten years, well, then you'll start to see some difference, right? So it's those tiny little investments. No single installment can do it tiny little investments, we need that cumulative effect to build up over time. Um, and so, so incredibly important principle, a biblical principle, an idea that we have to keep on investing, that when we miss, we have to keep after it, but keep making those small installments because they can key such a tremendous change over time. Now, like I said, you probably knew that already, right? But it bears repeating. Here's the second point I want to point out to you today. The second one is kind of the inverse of that. The neglect in our life is cumulative as well, right? So the positive is cumulative, but the negative can also be cumulative. And let, let me give you an example out of my own life about 
where the negative can begin to accumulate and begin to snowball and begin to cause you problems. Back, way back, a long, long time ago when I was in seminary, um, 15 years ago or whatever it was, when I started seminary, my very first semester I started off with Greek. And I had been doing Greek studies for about a year before I got to seminary because I don't like languages, frankly. I'm not good at languages. While I can preach and I can speak and I can kind of write in English, it's not very good if you pay attention to my, my details. I'm not a grammar guy. And then you, I studied Spanish for four years and I was really miserable at that. So I knew when I was getting to Greek, boy, I was going to be in trouble. I mean, that phrase, it's all Greek to me, is an appropriate phrase, right? So I get there and I'm working hard and I'm studying and I'm memorizing vocabulary. Who knew when I was in my 30s I'd be doing vocabulary once again? But I'm doing vocabulary and I'm memorizing it. But the reality of life begins to set in. I've got three really heavy courses. I'm working almost full time. I'm new in the Twin Cities and I started on staff at Spring Lake Park Baptist Church all at the same time. So slowly but surely, the cumulative effect of all that was I was running out of time. I didn't have time to really give my best to everything. And well, what do you tend to skip out on when you start to run out of time? You cut the thing you don't like first, right? Well, for me, that was Greek. And so I, I started to get a little behind in my vocabulary memorization. And if you know anything about a language, you, you have to learn those words because they're going to keep coming up. When you start a language, you start with the most common words and you work towards the least common words. So slowly but surely over that semester, my grade just started to go down. I ended up passing it with a C plus. But that was only because I had like A level work at the beginning and F level work at the end, right? If it wasn't for the early start, I would have been in deep, deep trouble. And so the neg negative cumulative effect is as true for us as the positive is that I was talking about. And that, that, that negative can slowly begin to build up on us. And so you have to be careful about it um, because it can undo all kinds of great things. It, it, it's kind of that idea that, you know, as I was saying, it's, it's okay if you miss a day of reading your Bible. It's okay if you miss a day of doing your devotions. Even if you miss two days, you know, okay, fine. But it's when it becomes two consecutive days and then it becomes three and then it becomes four and then all of a sudden you got to get a Swiffer to go find your Bible, right? You ever been there where you had to dust off your Bible? I'm not talking like your spare Bible. I mean, like, like your supposed normal used Bible, right? you got to dust that thing, right? You ever been there? I have a long time ago, but I've been there. It does happen. And, and, and the problem with that is when that time goes, when that time is gone out of our life, we can't get it back, right? We can't recapture it. Time is our most valuable property. Of all the things God has given us, it's the one thing we can't get more of. We can't go down to Heightenens and get a bucket of time. I don't know what's doing this here. Sorry. But we can't get any more time. Our time is limited. Our time is precious. Teach us, O oh God, as we learned to number our days because there is a limited number of them. So we know that, but again, it's worth repeating. <clears throat> now, the other thing that you've probably already heard, but you probably weren't thinking about today, is that there, there's no cumulative value to the random things that we all opt for over the important things, right? For instance, how many times do you find yourself like me with something you need to do, but instead you choose to watch TV, right? Now, if it was trying to see the Cubs get into the World Series, that might be an exception you can make. I mean, that's once in a lifetime for everybody, <laughs> right? So, 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 so you can make an exception, but... How many times do I need to watch that rerun of MASH, right? I've seen them all like 17 times. Do I need to watch that again? No. Do I tend to watch it again? I do. And do I have other stuff that would have been a better use of my time? I do. 
And so there's no positive to that random sort of thing. Is it okay to have random stuff? Sure. It's okay to relax. It's okay to have fun. It's okay to go out. It's okay to do that. But the problem is, for many of us at the very least, we choose those random things that are unimportant over the important things far, far too frequently. And as a result of that, the rest of our lives tend to suffer. And so I just wanted to remind you of those things because our time is our most valuable asset. So here's the question. Now, if you were God, and you loved us as much as God loves us, right? And you were the God who told us to number our days. If you were God, what would you as God say to us about how we are using our time? Well, we can probably guess if God is pleased or not with our use of our time, right? That's the conviction of the Holy Spirit. And the interesting thing is in Scripture, it talks about this. Uh, The New Testament book of Ephesians, as I read from earlier, in Ephesians 5, starting with verse 15, Paul talks about this. Paul understands this great idea that the small deposits of time over time can make a huge difference. It makes a difference in our relationships, in our spiritual walk. It makes a difference in every area of our life that are important to us. So, so here again, hear these words. The Apostle Paul wrote these words 2,000 years ago, but they are as true today as they were then. They're as true to the church at glory as they were to the church at Ephesus. Ephesians 5.15 says this, Be careful. In fact, he says, be very careful. Right? Be very careful then how it is you're going to live. Not as unwise, just don't, don't live as a fool, but live as wise. Paul says, think through how you're going to spend your time in life because if you don't, then you're going to end up at a place you didn't intend to go. In life, we have to have a vision for where we want to go, a roadmap, a direction we are trying to get to. Very few of us will ever set out on a vacation without an idea of our destination. Now, maybe for a weekend, it's fun to have a random adventure, right? But for most of us, we need to plan. What car are we going to take? Are we going to fly? Are we going to we're going to canoe there? Whatever. But you have to plan that out. And Paul is telling us to do so in every aspect of our life. Otherwise, we won't make good use of our time. And then Paul continues in verse 16. He says, making the most of every opportunity. And as I said, I didn't really like Greek, but occasionally I study Greek still. And, and as you look at that, making the most of time... Uh, Actually, the, it comes a little closer to Paul saying, redeem your time. That word redeem is a key. Redeem your time. Redeeming is kind of an accounting term, right? Uh, you know, taking your cash, you redeem it for something of value. You trade it in and get something in return of equal value, right? And when you think of how valuable your time is, this incredibly limited asset... When you think of how valuable that is, the Apostle Paul says, be careful with it and make the most out of every moment, out of every breath that God blows and breathes into your life. Make the most of it so that you can use it to his glory. Why? Because, as I said, the negative cumulative effect is in effect. If we don't use it, If we don't value it, if we aren't wise with it, we'll waste it, and then it'll be gone. Just poof, we can't get it back. And then listen to his reasoning for this, continuing on in verse 16. Paul says, here's why. Because the days are evil, right? In other words, he says, if if you just kind of pick up your feet... If you're just plodding along in life and you just pick up your feet and you let the waves and the currents of culture take you, you're going to drift. You're not going to redeem your time. 
Our culture is fantastic at creating distractions for us, right? It is. And, and, and again, I'm not here today to beat you up and to make you feel incredibly guilty because, you know, you went to a movie or, or you enjoyed yourself, you know, watching the baseball game last night or whatever it might be. Do that. But in all things, in moderation, right? Enjoy yourself when you're enjoying it. Do it. But if you're at your third episode of MASH that day or your fourth or your fifth or, or you just worked your way through a whole season of something on Netflix over a weekend, you might have had something you could have done instead of 12 consecutive episodes, right? So in moderation. Because here's the problem. And, and those of you who are more senior than me understand this greater than I do. But particularly for the younger people in the room, there's going to be a day when you hit your 30s or you hit your 40s or your 50s or your 60s or your 70s, but there will come a day where you're going to look back and go, man, I wish I would have used my time better. I could have done so much more. I could have had such a better legacy. I could have made such a bigger difference had I just been more wise about how I spent my time. We procrastinate. Sin is in the world. We're broken. We get distracted. Our culture, as I said, is fabulous at distracting us. I mean, every single day, I have hundreds of channels at my disposal to watch on TV. And there's always a hundred different things, even in our small town, that I could go and do and be distracted by. And so it's easy to kind of slide into those easy rhythms and patterns. It takes discipline for us to capture and to hold and to use our time wisely. And the problem is we don't know it until it's too late. We look back and realize we've hurt ourselves by not using our time well. Now, if I told you today that you were going to hurt yourself, how many of you would say, yeah, let's do that, right? Again, I don't know what our problem is today. Eh, let's go red. Occasionally, you have to be flexible. Problem is, I talk with my hands. No, uh, they still kind of work. Okay. Pardon me for that. Back to where we were. But if I said to you today, hey, come to church and you're going to hurt yourself, right? Does that sound like fun? Something you'd volunteer for? Something you'd sign up for? Something, you know, if I was making a list of people who would like to get in line to go hurt themselves, are you in? None of us are, Right? Uh, we're, we're, we're generally, as a people, pain averse. Yet, we don't manage and handle our time well. And, and the repercussions of it is that it hurts us. If we don't manage it well, it'll have a lasting impact. That negative consequence. And it was as true 2,000 years ago when Paul wrote it as it is today. And Paul goes on and he says this in his conclusion of sorts in verse 17, if you're still following along. Paul says, Therefore, don't be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. He says, You ought to do what you know you ought to do, right? Oftentimes, we have that conviction. Oftentimes, God speaks to us. Oftentimes, it comes in the voice of a spouse. Mine's my wife, right? You should go do this. When I'm watching that second or third car show that I've watched that day, because car shows are kind of the thing for me, right? Velocity TV, and there's a bunch of TV stations with car shows I could watch all day. And so she's like, well, maybe you should go do this. All right, fine, you know. Begrudgingly, I have to accept that she's right. Sometimes it's just the voice of the Holy Spirit reminding us, oh, hey, there's something you could be doing better with your time here. Paul says, don't be a fool. 
Do what you know you ought to be doing. And do it well while you are doing it. Don't continue to do the things that you know in the end would hurt you. Or don't neglect the things that you know you should be doing. Go in the direction that God wants you to go so that you will arrive at the destination you want to reach. Every one of us should live with the end goal in mind, right? Our time, our days are numbered. We're limited. We have that dash on our tombstone to get it all done. And that's it. There's a number before it, and there will be a number after it. And that dash, it's not very long. And so we have to choose how are we going to use it. We have to understand that within that then, that God has a plan for us as well. God has a plan for each and every one of our lives. But we have to pay attention. Paul says, don't live as a fool, but pay attention to what God's will is for you. Now, as we pay attention to that, if we keep that end in mind, it helps us take the focus off of ourselves. It helps us live in a way that is different. Our natural inclination, our natural direction as selfish, broken, sinful human beings, which you all are already admitted to being, myself included, right? Our natural inclination is to take the easy path. Our natural inclination is not towards discipline, but away from it. Our natural inclination is to make it about us, to do the things that I like to do, rather than the things that God would have us do. And God says, through Paul, hey, hold on. Don't be a fool. Don't make this about you. Don't miss this opportunity. Paul says, open your eyes. God is speaking to us. Maybe God is speaking to you right now. God should hopefully be speaking to all of us right now about redeeming the value of our time. And if we make it less about us and more about God, and we begin to make him the focus of our time rather than us, we will begin to redeem more and more of what he has given us. And as we do that, we will use it for his glory. And as we use it for his glory, at the end of our days, when someday I or somebody like me comes and preaches at your funeral, we'll be able to look at that dash. We'll be able to go, wow, look at what they have done. Look at that legacy. Look at the difference that they have made. Because their focus was on being godly and living rightly, and not on being a fool, as Paul warns. So if, so if Paul, through these words, God, through Paul, is speaking to you today, if God is saying, hey, pay attention here today, that's a good thing. Because as I said, I think we all have areas in our lives where we can improve or we can get better at. And for many of us, the use of our time is one of them. There's huge spiritual implications to this. And what we can accomplish as individuals for God's glory and as a church for God's glory will largely be governed on how we spend our time. Everything we give to the church is important. Time, treasure, and talents. But the one most precious resource that we will get no more of is our time. So if this morning God is convicting you, lean into that. Pray it through a little bit. Pay attention to it. Say, God, everything you've given me is a blessing and I want to use it to your glory, including my time, Lord. And Lord, if I may use my time better, show me your ways. But then don't just leave it there. Take steps. God has a will for you. God has a plan for you. God has great things in store for each and every one of us. Find out what it is. Find out where your passions lie. Lean into them and grow in them and use that to God's glory. 
You don't have time to waste if you want to leave a lasting impact. If you want to have a legacy. Something that will outlive all of us. So this week, as you go out, as you leave here, go asking yourself, where do I need to begin to make some time deposits? Do I need to be more disciplined in my spiritual time, in my devotions, in my reading of God's word, in my prayer time? Time in prayer is never wasted. Keep that in mind. Time in prayer is never wasted time. So if it's prayer, find a way to pray more. I've explained this before, I think, to you guys, but one of the ways that I've learned to pray more, and it doesn't work that well in Aiken, frankly, but one of the ways that I learned to pray back when I was in seminary, I said, God, how can I redeem, redeem my time better? I lived in East St. Paul after my wife and I got married, and it was a 40-plus minute commute every morning to Bethel Seminary, sitting in my truck, inching along in traffic. And I could sit there raging about gridlock and road construction, or I could redeem that time. And one of the things God taught me to do is I, I, keep a, I would keep a sticky notepad and I'd write prayer requests on that sticky pad and I'd stick them on my dash. And any time that my vehicle would come to a stop, be it at a stoplight or somewhere in traffic, right there on my dash is a list of people and things I could be praying for. I'd just say a, a prayer. I'd keep my eyes open so that if the light turned green, I'd know to go. You can pray with your eyes open. That is okay. But so I began to capture some of that otherwise wasted time. And that increased exponentially my prayer life. Now, sometimes it was praying for the madman next to me, but that sometimes needed too. So that is just one of many little ways. That didn't take a big change in my life, but that changed my life over time. Simply by praying when I sit at stoplights. Again, we only got one in Aiken. It's a long one, mind you. So you will get some praying done. But you get the idea. I kind of joked, but was serious. You know, one of the things I used to tell my high school kids when I was uh, overseeing the high school youth group of my other churches, I tell them, keep a Bible in the back of the toilet. You're going to be there a couple times a day. Right? Got to have something to do. More often than not, like I said, they're all on their phones. Well, it's just kind of gross. Leave the Bible on the toilet. Don't take that one to church with you. Thank you. But if you have a Bible in the back of the toilet, when you sit down, get some work done. Right? Think of creative little places, creative little ways. that It doesn't take a life change to read the Bible when you're on the toilet or to pray when you're in the car or anything like that. Listen to scripture on your phone while you're in the shower. Lots of little ways. But make those small investments of time that can be cumulative over time, that can make a radical difference, that will transform you and the legacy that you will leave. So as I said, as you go this week, go with that in mind, thinking through where can I redeem my time better? Where can I begin to make constant and consistent deposits of time? That when it's all done, when they're telling my story, it will have made the difference. Let's all do that to the glory of God this week. Amen.